Well, very good evening and a very warm welcome to you all. Good to see you. Good to see Jean and Amy and Neil and Janet with us. So just a reminder, Road to Recovery is on Tuesday evening. We've got DJ who's going to speak for us. And we've been looking at ways that we can develop road to recovery. We've been talking with Mandy Nutt who runs the road to recovery in Tain. And we hope to hold a, a joint road to recovery periodically. So that would be something that you could pray for, please. Prayer meeting will be myself. God willing. And Friday, we have the Eastern Bartonshire Food Bank operating from 11 till 1. So that's under restricted conditions, of course. And a reminder, we've also got uh, our own Harvest Basket Food Bank, which is really available on request. So if anyone if you know anyone who needs any out of hours help, we'd be very glad to help out. And I think that's all at the moment, but uh, we'll begin our worship of God by singing to his praise in Psalm 111 from verse one to the end of verse six. Praise ye the Lord with my whole heart. I will God's praise declare where the assemblies of the just and congregations are. To the praise of God. <coughs> Praise ye the Lord with my whole heart. I will God's praise declare where the assemblies of the just and congregations are. The whole works of the Lord our God are great above all measure. So that they are of everyone that doth therein take pleasure. This work most honorable is most glorious and pure, and his untainted righteousness forever doth endure. His works most wonderful he hath made to be thought upon. The Lord is gracious and he is full of compassion. He giveth me to He giveth me to true all those that truly to fear and evermore is covenant he in his mind will bear. He did the power of his works unto his people show. When he the heathen heritage upon them did bestow. We'll pray together. Our gracious God and our 
loving Heavenly Father. We look to you once again, Lord, to bless us. We praise you and thank you that you've once again, Lord, gathered us together on this lovely evening, Lord, this Lord's Day Eve. And we pray, Lord, that you would make yourself known in our midst and in our hearts, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for the words we were just singing. Praise ye the Lord with my whole heart. I will God's praise declare. May it be so, Lord, that we would be stirred up to magnify and bless your holy name, that you would help us this evening, Lord, to worship you in spirit and in truth, that you might be exalted, Lord, and that you would inhabit the praises of your people according to your own precious word. We thank you, Lord, that you are the God who is sovereign and you are the God who is almighty. You are the God who is loving and caring and compassionate, Lord. And you're the God who is righteous and yet gracious and full of compassion. We thank you, Lord, that you're the God who provides for us in so many ways. In your providence, Lord, you bring things about to bless us and help us. We thank you, Lord, this evening that you understand us as who we are and for who we are. And we bless you and thank you, Lord, that you accept us in Jesus Christ, that we can come to Jesus as we are. And yet, Lord, you take us and you cleanse us and you don't leave us as we are. We bless you for that, Lord, that you wipe away our sins and that you then work in us, Lord, and to bring in about, Lord, a Christ-likeness in us. And we pray, Lord, that you would continue to work in us and that we would, Lord, yield to your spirit. We confess our sins this evening and we pray, Lord, that once again, you would forgive us for all our many sins. We thank you, Lord, that you have promised if we are faithful to confess our sins, that you are faithful to forgive our sins. And we rejoice in the great and glorious and merciful Savior that you are and that we can call you our Savior, that we can call you our Redeemer, and thank you, Lord, that you are our Father. And we pray this evening that you would fill our hearts, Lord, with thankfulness and that we would be a, praise, a praising and thankful people. We thank you, Lord, in all aspects of our lives, how you guide us, direct us, and take care of us. And we want to acknowledge that this evening, Lord and to give you all the glory for it. We pray for uh, the work of the gospel to the ends of the earth this evening, Lord. We ask, O oh Lord, that you would just bring your word, Lord, in a way that would impact lives, that would change lives, that would bring salvation, that would only uh, not only impact individuals, but communities and uh, districts and nations, Lord, and indeed all the nations to the ends of the earth, that your word, as it goes out today, Lord, would accomplish what you have purposed in the lives of your people, Lord, and that it would bring many into a relationship with yourself. We do thank you, Father, for the work of the gospel in the free church, and in our partners, Lord, we thank you for that. We pray this evening, Lord, that every pulpit and every preacher in the land who preaches the gospel of Jesus Christ would be blessed, Lord, and every congregation that comes under the sound of the word would truly be blessed, built up, and edified in wonderful ways. And Lord, we thank you for our own uh, land. We know, Lord, that as a people in our nation, we've gone 
far from you, but we pray, Lord, you would forgive us as a nation and that you would turn our hearts again to yourself, Lord. We pray, Father, in the midst of the COVID uh, crisis, that again, Lord, a strategy would be implemented, put into place, Lord, that would be really effective and a strategy, Lord, that could truly uh, just show us, Lord, your hand in it all, that you can turn about a situation in the blink of an eye and overnight you can turn the heart of a nation. And we pray, Father, that we would see wonderful advances in the medical research and in the medical uh, fight against COVID. We pray for those families who have been affected and sorrowing. We pray, Lord, for peace and grace, Lord, and just encouragement and healing. And those who are sorrowing, Lord, that you would draw very close to them. We remember Ross's friends, Lord, that you would give them healing. And Ian and Kim, Lord, that you would truly bring them, Lord, to a place of health and strength once again. And our gracious God, we do pray for the geopolitical situation in the world. Once again, Lord, we are reminded of the situation in Asia, we pray, Father, that there would be uh, a calming influence, that your spirit would come, Lord, to give wisdom and to give uh, the diplomatic help, Lord, that is needed to uh, just break through and to uh, free people from escalating situations, Lord. We ask, Father, that there would be peace in Europe, and in the UK, as there is a, still the Brexit struggle is ongoing, we ask, Father, that you would give wisdom and that there would be a turning to Christ in the nation. We pray, Lord, for our missionary friends. We think of Gabriel and Deborah and the children, Lord. Living God, bless them and keep them and help them, Lord. And bless, Lord, the work of the gospel in their midst, Lord that they would have souls for their hire. And we pray, Father, for Mar uh, Mark and Virgin and Walter and Armand, Lord. You know the work they are involved in, in South America, Pakistan, and Africa, Lord. We ask, Father, that you would richly bless them, Lord. Give them all the help they need, Lord, that you would supply all their needs according to your riches in glory, Lord. And our Father, we do pray for ourselves, Lord, in our communities, that we would see a wonderful turning to Christ. And we really pray, Lord, for a breakthrough, that once again we could gather to worship, Lord, without restriction and without fear of endangering anyone's safety or indeed endangering anyone's lives. We pray, Father, for the schools and colleges and universities, the students. We pray, Lord, that your hand it would be upon them for good and that you would continue to support and bless them, Lord, and keep them safe. So, Lord, we do pray for everyone in the congregation, Lord, and every family represented. You know the burdens each soul carries. You know, Lord, the silent burdens, you know, Lord, the, the health issues, you know, the various stresses that come. We pray, Father, that you would bring hope and comfort and that, Lord, you would bring relief. We remember Chris, Lord, as he goes for an interview, we pray, Father, that that would be favorable for him and that you would just work out all things together. For his good. Bless Laura at this time, Lord, and encourage them all as a family, Lord. We do pray, Father, for these things in the precious name of Jesus. And we ask, O oh Lord God, that you would be glorified here tonight and that we could truly acknowledge from our hearts that it was good for us to have been together. 
And we ask it in Jesus' name, with the forgiveness of all our sins. Amen. We're going to sing our first hymn now, which is a lovely Celtic hymn, Be Thou My Vision, O Lord of My Heart. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Oh, not be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking or sleeping, thy presence my life. Riches I heed not, nor man's empty prayers. Oh, thou mine inheritance now and always. Thou and only burst in my heart. I king of heaven, my treasure thou art. I king of heaven, my victory won. Oh, may I reach heaven's joys, O bright heaven sun. Still be my vision, O ruler of all. We'll turn uh, to the Old Testament book of Genesis, and we'll, we're continuing in our study in Genesis chapter 26, and we'll read from verse 6. So Isaac settled in Gerar. When the men of the place asked him about his wife, he said, she is my sister. For he feared to say my wife, thinking lest the men of the place should kill me because of Rebekah, because she was attractive in appearance. When he had been there a long time, Abimelech, king of the Philistines, looked out of her window and saw Isaac laughing with Rebekah, his wife. So Abimelech called Isaac and said, Behold, she is your wife. How then could you say she is my sister? Isaac said to him, Because I thought, lest I die because of her. Abimelech said, What is this you have done to us? One of the people might easily have lain with your wife, and you would have brought guilt upon us. So Abimelech warned all the people, saying, Whoever touches this man or his wife shall surely be put to death. And Isaac sowed in that land and reaped in the same year a hundredfold. The Lord blessed him, and the man became rich and gained more and more until he became very wealthy. He had possessions of flocks and herds and many servants, so that the Philistines envied him. Now the Philistines had stopped and filled with earth all the wells that his father's servants had dug in the days of Abraham, his father. And Abimelech said to Isaac, Go away from us, for you are much mightier than we. So Isaac departed from there and encamped in the valley of Gerar and settled there. And Isaac dug again the wells of water that had been dug in the days of Abraham, his father, which the Philistines had stopped after the death of Abraham. And he gave them the names that his father had given them. But when Isaac's servants dug in the valley, and found there a well of spring water. The herdsmen of Gerar quarreled with Isaac's herdsmen 
saying, the water is ours. So he called the name of the well Esse, because they contended with him. Then they dug another well, and they quarreled over that also. So he called its name Satna. And he moved from there and dug another well, and they did not quarrel over it. So he called its name Rehoboth, saying, For now the Lord has made room for us, and we shall be fruitful in the land. From there he went to Beersheba, and the Lord appeared to him the same night and said, I am the God of Abraham, your father. Fear not, for I am with you and will bless you and multiply your offspring for my servant Abraham's sake. So he built an altar there and called upon the name of the Lord and pitched his tent there. And there Isaac's servants dug a well. When Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzath, his advisor, and Fikol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, Why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? They said, We see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us. Let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good and have sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. So he made them a feast and they ate and drank. In the morning they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. That same day, Isaac's servants came and told him about the well they had dug and said to him, We have found water. He called it Sheba. Therefore, the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. When Esau was 40 years old, he took Judith, the daughter of Biri, the Hittite, to be his wife, and Besamath, the daughter of Elon, the Hittite, and they made life better for Isaac and Rebekah. Amen. And we pray the Lord will bless that reading of his own precious and holy word, and to his own name be honor, praise, and glory. Once again, we'll worship God by singing in Psalm 119 from verse 1 to the end of the verse marked day. Blessed are they that undefiled and straight are in the way, who in the Lord's most holy law do walk and do not stray. To God's praise. Blessed are they that are defiled and straight are in the way, who in the Lord most holy Lord do walk and do not stray. Blessed Thy praises 
Let's pray together before we turn to God's word. Father, once again, we look to you to help us, Lord, to bless us as we turn to your word, as we meditate upon your word, Lord. We pray that your spirit would lead us into your truth, that you would take the things of God and Christ, make them known to us, Lord. Help us to understand what you are saying. And we pray, Lord, that you would have all the honor, praise, and glory. In Jesus' precious name, Father. Amen. Well, years ago, there was a drought in Connecticut in the USA. The waters disappeared from the hills, and the farmers drove their cattle into valleys. The streams began to fail, and there was a man of God there. And they said to him, you mustn't send your flocks down here anymore because there was such little water. And the old man gathered his family around the family altar, so to speak, and on their knees before God, they cried with supplication and tears for water, but the flocks and herds might not perish. And afterwards, he went into the hills, and in a place that he had walked heaps of times before, he saw the ground was dark and moist. And when he turned up the soil, water started to come. And the family came with pails and watered the stock. The stock, and they made troughs reaching to the house. Water was that plentiful. And, you know, we were talking about the wells and the difficulties that Isaac faced over the wells and the blessings that came out of them. And one of the blessings that we see tonight is that Isaac returned to the Lord. He built an altar to the Lord. A family altar is such an important thing in our lives. And really, we're not talking about building an altar that we can see. What it's, it's meant here is that we have a time where as families, we come together before the Lord to seek his face and to seek his blessing. And of course, 
Isaac a backslidden, and yet in spite of the fact that he wasn't fully returned to the Lord, God's blessing was upon him. We've seen that last week. And now we see God's blessing again on Isaac. And I want to look at God's blessing on Isaac. And the first thing that we see here is the revelation of God to Isaac. We spoke about Christ appearing in the morning. He appeared, he's now appearing, and he will appear. And what we read here is, the Lord appeared to him the same night, the same night that he had arrived at Beersheba. And the fighting not only caused more wells to be dug, but it drove Isaac back to Canaan. It also caused the word of God to come to him. It caused the revelation of God. God appeared to Isaac and God spoke to him. And in Psalm 119, verse 72, the psalmist said, it's good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn your statutes. And God often in providence uses providence to bring us back to the true worship of God when we err and when we stray. And troubles often help us to better understand the word of God because we can examine our lives in the light of God's word and what is happening around us. We didn't trust in our own understanding we need to look at what the Word of God says about our particular situation. Because if we don't uh, examine what's happening in the light of the Word of God, then we're not examining it in the light at all. So Isaac made a stand. He took a stand at Beersheba. And this place was linked with the Philist uh, Abraham's dealings with the Philistines. And the name means the well of the oath. Uh, the Philistines had sworn to leave Abraham alone as long as, so long as he left them alone. And it was there that the Philistines had confessed that Abraham had something wonderful. They confessed that God was with Abraham. Now, Isaac now came to that same place and there God came to him. And once again, God spoke to him about the covenant, speaking to him. And we know that that is God's word. And God reveals his, himself, and the Lord reveals his word. I am the God of your father Abraham. The word reveals the person, the God of your father, Abraham. And the word reveals the protection of God. Fear not, we're told. So it's the covenant God. And the covenant God has told Isaac to fear not. So he's protected. I am with you. And there's the presence of God. There's the promise of God. I will bless you and multiply your offspring. Friends, in Jesus Christ, we have the God of our father Abraham. And we have the assurance that we are not to fear, that he is with us, his presence. I am with you always. And we have the promise I will bless you and multiply your offspring. The promises of God are for our children, our children's children, as many as are afar off, as many as the Lord, our God, will call. And you see, the revelation was a wonderful one. It brought the word of God to Isaac and the assurance of God as his covenant God. And the response that Isaac had was one of worship. 
That's what we need, friends. We need a fresh look and a fresh touch from God. Isaac had strayed and a fresh touch from God had brought him back into that place of worship. And he built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord. The conflicts had driven Isaac back to Beersheba, where his father had been like we'd looked at. But Isaac was now in the right place. He was in the place of God's choosing. And when we are in God's will, the word of God came to him. And this led to the worship of God. The word of God promoted worship. And friends, that's what our worship, when we talk about worshiping God in spirit and in truth, that is, we worship God according to the truth of his word and by the spirit of God. Isaac, we're not told, made any altars to worship in the land of the Philistine. And this just emphasizes the truth that when a person is not in the will of God, then surely that person's worship and fellowship is affected. Isaac's response was powerful. He responded in three ways. Worship by building an altar. He gave the Lord his heart, his life, his all, building an altar. And friends, this involved preparation. An altar just doesn't build itself. And it involved commitment with the Lord in focus. So it involved worship, and he responded in word. The word of the Lord came to him. The revelation of the Lord came to him. Uh, it brought a response of worship, and it brought a response of word. He called on the name of the Lord. Friends, what a wonderful thing. He prepared an altar in faith, and now he in faith called on the name of the Lord. He confessed with his mouth the truth that was in his heart. And lastly, he responded indeed by word. He responded with worship in word and in deed work, for he pitched his tent there, and there Isaac's servants dug a well. True worship is in spirit and in truth. True faith honors God. Faith alone saves. Faith alone in Christ alone, I should say, saves. People can have faith in many things, but it's only Christ that saves. But the faith that saves us is never alone. Because the faith that saves expresses itself in worship, in love. And it's the faith that takes action. Faith without works is dead. James 2.17, it says, So also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. Faith expresses itself in loving devotion and service. Love to God and love to neighbor. neighbors. In, in things getting done for God, another well, another landmark, of blessing in enemy country, but now back in his own country, in a dry and barren land they were digging, now close by where Abraham had dug. They were following the Lord, and they were following Abraham's example. What a blessing that is for us to follow the Lord and to be inspired and encouraged by the example of godly women and men who have gone before us. What had been discovered by the faithful servant and friend of God, who had gone home to glory, to, to his reward, was now being rediscovered by Isaac. And so the response of Isaac was to worship. And then there was a response to Isaac by the Philistines. After the success regarding the wells, Abimelech came seeking friendship. Hello. The same man that said, go away from us. You're too mighty. He wanted a peace covenant with Isaac. And here again, 
the Philistines showed up. The Holy Spirit records their approach. It says, when Abimelech went to him from Gerar with Ahuzah, his advisor, and Ficol, the commander of his army, Isaac said to them, why have you come to me, seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you? This was right after Isaac's time with the Lord, after Isaac had built an altar and called on the name of the Lord. And here we see that Isaac was now moving in the power of the Lord. And the Philistines came with an attitude, but it wasn't the same attitude. It was a different attitude. They came in force, their king, and one, close, and one of his close advisors, and the army commander. This was a rerun of the Abraham story Isaac was tested in the same way. They were serious. They knew that the blessing of God was upon Isaac and that Isaac was a force to be reckoned with under the mighty favor of God. Now, this was an impressive group of uh, ambassadors and dignitaries, and it shows us that Abimelech was serious about a new covenant. You don't take your top advisors and your chief of, army chief of staff with you unless you really want a peace deal. The rank of the official sent to any country by a nation to another people shows us the importance that is attached to the matter being dealt with. And friends, let us remember this wonderful truth and the importance that God attached to it. The Father sent his beloved Son into the world, into this world. This shows the value that God places on souls and on salvation. The King of heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ came. The Father and the Holy Spirit both testified to him. The, our God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit love us with an everlasting love, and we are of wonderful value to God. We are of infinite value because God is an infinite person, and God gave himself for us. God initiated his covenant with us. God is always the one who initiates it. He came to seek and to save that which was lost. That's us, friends. We were lost. I was lost, but Jesus found me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. The Philistines really are a type of the world, of unbelievers, of the enemies of God. They came to Isaac. And let's remember, friends, we were the enemies of God. Were we so different from the Philistines? God came to us. We didn't go to God. God came to us because God came to us in Jesus and God is with us. And we're told, for if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. How much more now that we are reconciled? shall we be saved by his life. Like we said a few years earlier, Abimelech had made a covenant with Abraham. But the evil that Abimelech and the Philistines had loosed against Isaac was a travesty and an absolute violation of the covenant. A new covenant with Isaac was needed to replace the old one and to put the principles of the old one back in place. Friends, here we have perhaps, if we think about it, if you like, a type of the old covenant and how nobody could keep the covenant. Everybody broke the law. And here we have a type of the new covenant with the son of promise with Isaac, and we know fine that Jesus Christ, 
the new covenant, the new testament is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. And how Isaac typifies this. We are mindful when Moses came down with the commandments, he found the, uh, the, the Israelites worshiping a golden calf and he smashed the tablets. And this was indicative of sinners like us, unable to keep the law. We broke the law, and the tablets were typical of that. And the second time he came down was indicative of the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who has the law in his heart. And in Christ, friends, we have been given the law in our hearts because we are no longer under the law but under grace and then came a request and you see they requested something of isaac isaac received them but he also rebuked them isaac said to them why have you come to me seeing that you hate me and have sent me away from you now friends this was wonderfully biblical for Isaac to do this. The rebuke was needed. You cannot put things right without first addressing evil. We can't brush over evil. We know that love covers over a multitude of sins, but love does not ignore sin. God does not ignore sin. And love covers over the multitude of our sin because God deals with it in Jesus. And the principle here is that we must rebuke evil before we can have peace with others. Isaac knew that he was in a very strong position. He'd always been in a strong position. But he, had he only accepted it, had he only been in that place of faith and worship, but he had just lingered and wandered away a bit, like we do. Then he, they said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. So we said, let there be a sworn pact between us, between you and us, and let us make a covenant with you, that you will do us no harm, just as we have not touched you and have done to you nothing but good, Wow, what lies. And I've sent you away in peace. You are now the blessed of the Lord. Here they were claiming that they had done Isaac nothing but good. They said, we see plainly that the Lord has been with you. The evidence of God's blessing was with and upon Isaac so strongly. Every well he dug, there was water. His servants, his riches, his herds, everything was multiplying. And he was much mightier than the Philistines. Abimelech wanted to have peace with the godly man who was blessed of the Lord. And friends, that was a wise thing. That was a wise move to want peace with God's people. I think it's very foolish ultimately to contend with God's people because actually those who are contending with the people of God are ultimately contending with God. And it's a very wise move of any nation or ruler that wants to honor God by honoring God's people. And if rulers would be at peace with God's people, we would see that righteousness exalts a nation. But sadly, rulers are opposing God's people, even persecuting and killing them. Abimelech in his request says, let us make a covenant with you that you will do us no harm just as we have not touched you and I've done nothing to you but good and I've sent you away in peace. And now this is a bare-faced lie. It's astonishing cheek. Abimelech had done Isaac plenty harm. They had persecuted him. They had caused him problems. They stole his wells. They filled in his father's wells. They mistreated him, and they were opposing him in so many ways. Yet, listen to the lie. They boldly claimed they had done him nothing but good. 
We had a strange idea of good when Isaac had to leave the land because of them. Certainly, the Philistines' appraisal of their own character and behavior is nonsense. But that's what happens without the Spirit of God showing us who we are. We have a great opinion of ourselves. Before I came to Christ, I thought, well, I'm all right, you know, I'm not a bad person. It's flattering to themselves rather than true. And folks often imagine, me included, before I came to Christ, how a pretty good chap I was, not the worst, and that God will accept us on that basis. I never felt that God would accept me on that basis, but I felt, hey, I'm not too bad. But many people imagine that God will accept them because they're quite good and they never do any harm to anyone. Well, by not receiving Christ, they're doing a lot of harm to themselves and to their families and to the Lord in despising him. The Philistines, and remember friends, there but for the grace of God go I and each one of us. Every one of us are beholden to God for his amazing grace and love. The Philistines came to Isaac telling him how good they were to him. The men now wished to make peace with Isaac. Why? Because they knew the Lord was with them. They knew that the mighty Lord was with Isaac. They paid some kind of uh, lip service to the Lord. They didn't know him, but they were afraid of him in the wrong kind of way. But there is also the fact that Isaac had put a blight on his witness because Abimelech may have remembered that Isaac had lied to him regarding Rebekah. So he may have feared, but Isaac could have harmed them. He may have had, what if Isaac is not a man of his word? They still wanted things their way, the advantage, that you will do us no harm. It's clear they were afraid of Isaac, but it's a one-sided request. There's no mention here in the terms of any advantage for Isaac. The Philistines are only interested in their own well-being. But Isaac had been that way with Rebecca and the way he had lied too. He was only interested in his own well-being and he could have caused a lot of problems for the Philistines. But friends, how we are reminded that God has made a covenant with his son, the father and the son, have covenanted together for our well-being, for our salvation, and all the advantage is for you and I, if we will but put our faith in Christ. Now, covenants and treaties were ratified in those days differently. Today, we would probably sign contracts and get witnesses and things, but back then, they, they usually had a feast. They ate and drank, we're told. Uh, there was a covenant feast, a token of goodwill. Isaac, in wonderful integrity, respect and honor, honors the Philistines with everything that a man of honor would do for a friendly relationship. And this is what we are told to do. If possible, so far as it depends upon you, Live peacefully with all. And the next morning, they rose early and exchanged oaths. And Isaac sent them on their way. And they departed from him in peace. The last thing in the ratifying of the covenant was the oath to each other. Like we said, we sign agreements in different ways. But the result of this was that Isaac sent them on their way, and they departed from him in peace. Notice the reversal of the circumstances. They sent Isaac away because they hated him and were afraid of him and afraid of his God and afraid of his power. They had not sent Isaac away in peace. 
They had sent him away with trepidation and enmity, but here Isaac sent them away and they departed from him in peace. Peace was the result of the covenant, dear friends. When a man's ways please the Lord, Proverbs 16, 7 tells us, he makes even his enemies to be at peace with him. They were glad to seek Isaac and to seek real peace. They saw that Isaac was indeed a mighty man and his God was indeed mighty and they wanted to take hold of Isaac's peace. And friends, that's the advice for anyone who hasn't put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Our God is a mighty God and we need to make peace with him. We can't refuse God because he's mighty and powerful. We need to take hold of his grace and his peace in our lives because without taking hold of his covenant, we can have no peace. Isaac feasted them and he forgave them. However, he wanted no fellowship with them. Isaac was a friend to sinners, but here now he is no friend to sin. He wanted no fellowship with them, so he sent them away. Friends, we are to be friends with sinners, and we are to do everything that we can, when we can. But we are to have no fellowship with sinners, because what fellowship has light with darkness? We can't have fellowship with unbelievers, but we can love unbelievers for Christ's sake, and we can work with them and for them, but we are not, in, we are in the world, but we are not of the world. Isaac sent them away and they departed in peace. The believer and the world, there must be a separation from the world. You and I are to be in the world to love sinners, to be a friend of sinners, like our Lord Jesus Christ was but we are not to be friends of sin. You see, there's a big difference between being a friend of sinners and being a friend of sin. That same day, Isaac's servant came and told him about the well they had dug and said to him, we have a friend, we have found water. He called it Sheba because of the name of the city is Beersheba to this day. Once the covenant had been settled, and it was a selfish covenant from the point of view of the Philistines. And the unbelievers themselves were allowed to depart. Once Isaac had again taken his stand with the Lord in worship, in word, in deed, and in separation from the world, new sources of blessing could be enjoyed. The believer who was faithful will find the blessings of God in the wells of salvation found in Christ. Even in the dry parched land, even in Baker's Vale, there are pools of blessing for the believer. The unbelievers were as glad to leave Isaac as Isaac was indeed to see them go. They acknowledged the fact that the Lord was with Isaac, that the Lord's blessing was upon Isaac, and all that he did, but they had no heart to seek the Lord for themselves. They knew that Isaac knew the Lord, but they themselves had no interest in knowing the Lord. Friends, there can be no real peace for anyone except that peace is found only in Jesus Christ. The peace of the Philistines did not last because when we go into the book of Judges, we see that David was often at war with the Philistines and ultimately David sealed them, sealed their faith because they would not be at peace with God's people. So may the Lord bless his word to us. Let's pray together. Our Father, we thank you for your blessing to us as your people, Lord. 
And thank you, Lord, for the way you take us. And you ensure, Lord, that we are back in that place, Lord, of worship and fellowship with yourself. And we pray, Lord, we would be wise in the way we deal with the world, that we would love people for Jesus' sake. And yet, Lord, that we would not love the world, but that we would love people. We pray, Father, that you would guard us and keep us in the way everlasting. And we thank you, Lord, for the covenant of peace in our Lord Jesus Christ, who to know is life eternal. In his precious name we pray it, Lord. Amen. We're going to sing our last hymn now, which is The Amazing Grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Remember, dear friends, the only difference between you and I and the worst Philistine is simply the grace of God. Amazing grace, how sweet. The sound that saved a wretch like me. I was lost, lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now. I see Twas grace That taught My heart To fear And grace My fears Relieved oh, How precious dear the grace appeared the hour I first believed through many dangers, toils, and snares I have. pray that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God our Father, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit would rest upon you and remain upon you and all who you love now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>